So now we're going to see uh, examples of how Western blots, blots are used by scientists to quantitate protein levels. And so I've taken a random figure out of a paper. I just want to show you um, how scientists uh, use Western blots. So if you look in this uh, blot on the left, um, let's number the lanes so you can see what I'm referring to, lanes 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. Um, and usually above the lanes is written something that indicates how the samples were treated. So if you looked above the lanes, there are terms like DMSO, 0 0.73, 0 0.73, and above that it says 4 hours. And those are in lanes 1, 2, and 3, and then next to it is 24 hours. And you'll get to learn about the nomenclature as we read more and more papers. In this instance, um, they are adding uh, drugs to a cell, in increasing concentrations of drugs, and testing the protein levels at 4 hours and 24 hours post-treatment of drugs. DMSO is the negative control. That is an organic solvent that drugs are dissolved in. So in lane 1, that's actually cells treated with just organic solvent, no drug. In the next lane, 0.73, that refers to the concentration of drug, 7.3, 10 times more drug. And so lanes 1, 2, and 3 are looking at a 4-hour time point, lanes 4, 5, and 6 are looking at a 24-hour time point. And below those uh, numbers are different proteins that the scientists look for. They don't typically look for more than one protein, um, and I'll, we'll talk about those proteins that they look for now. Um, so here are, and we'll focus on the first three lanes. In lane one, no drug, just the MSO. Lane two, drug. Lane three, more drug. Now, the first protein they look for is GAP-DH. And when you look at a Western blot, typically um, alongside the band, you will see um, a term that refers to the protein that they are identifying in that um, Western blot. And see here we've got three panels stacked on top of each other. So they're looking at three different um, protein levels. Actually the top two are the same protein, but we'll get into that in a minute. Um, so typically you don't just see uh, the whole um, gel that they're showing you. They just show you a narrow strip of that gel and the relevant protein. So at the bottom they're looking at a protein called GAP-DH. And to do a Western blot, you need an antibody, and they're using an antibody that binds GAP-DH. And if you look at the levels of GAP-DH in lanes 1, 2, and 3, it doesn't really change. The band intensities are not drastically different. And that's a good thing, because GAP-DH is known as a housekeeping gene, or a loading control. And in cells, most all cells in the body make this GAP-DH uh, protein, it's an enzyme, all cells make it, and it typically does not change um, over treatment or over time. So it's what's known as a loading control, just to prove to the reader that yes, in fact, protein is loaded onto the gel from cells. So you will typically see in Western blots, in, uh, in good uh, figures, some sort of loading control. Actin is another one, or tubulin, just a protein that is very common and very abundant in every cell and doesn't change no matter what you really do to the cell. So GAP-DH is the loading control here. And you can see the levels of GAP-DH don't really change. And, but they're not really interested in GAP-DH. What they're interested in is this protein called ERK1 and ERK2. So if you look at the left, it says ERK1 slash 2, and you'll learn that um, sometimes antibodies are used that probe multiple pro proteins that are very similar, and so the antibodies recognize multiple proteins. So in fact, and this will be focused more on in chapter 6, uh, cytoplasmic signaling proteins, there's a protein called ERK1 and a protein called ERK2, and they are 99% identical to one another. So tiny differences, um, so two different genes, um, but they make proteins that look d d almost the same, these proteins are redundant in their function, and so um, scientists, when they're studying the effects of, um, of a drug on ERK and the ERK pathway, they'll look at both proteins because antibodies will bind both of them. So in each of these cell conditions, they want to know the levels of the ERK proteins, ERK1 and ERK2. So what are they going to use? 
an antibody that binds ERK proteins. And this antibody can't distinguish between one or two. So when they look at the Western blot, you're looking at ERK1 and ERK2, and that's when you see two bands, uh, basically a higher band up here and a lower band down here. One of those is ERK1 and one of those is ERK2. And it doesn't really matter that there are two of them, it just matters that the proteins are there. And so they're looking at the intensities. And so if you compare the intensity here in lane one versus lanes two and three, there's not a significant decrease or increase in the ERK1-2 levels. Maybe a slight decrease, um, but nothing too significant. So the ERK protein levels don't seem to change in uh, cells treated with this drug for four hours. But that's not surprising because it's known that ERK activity, and you'll learn again what ERK is in the next chapter, is controlled by phosphorylation. And so that top section of the figure is actually an antibody um, identifying phosphorylated versions of ERK. So if you look in the nomenclature next to the top section of the blot, it just doesn't say ERK1 or ERK2. It says P ERK1. THR202, or PERC2, TYR204. So um, when you see a, usually a P in front of a version of a protein and a amino acid like a tyrosine or threonine or serine followed by a number, it typically is referring to um, the phosphorylated version of that protein at a certain amino acid. So for example, ERC1... Um, according to this blot, can be phosphorylated on threonine at a position 202. ERK2 can be phosphorylated on a tyrosine at position 204. And so um, we've talked about the fact that phosphorylation can control the activity of proteins. So, and we will come to know that phosphorylation controls the activity of ERK. When ERK is phosphorylated, it's in one state. When it's not phosphorylated, it's in another state. And so it's actually important to the researchers to know, is ERK phosphorylated or not phosphorylated? Um, does the drug affect ERK phosphorylation? So how does one study the phosphorylation of a protein? You can easily use a Western blot because there are these antibodies that bind not just the protein, but the phosphorylated version of the protein. So that um, top panel, they're using antibodies that bind phosphorylated ERK. So these antibodies have an antibody binding site that binds specifically to the phosphate group, to that amino acid on ERK. And so if ERK is phosphorylated at that amino acid, the antibody will bind to it, stick to it, and you'll see that band light up. If there's no phosphorylation, that antibody will not bind to that protein. So if you look in lanes 1, 2, and 3, in lane 1, you can see it's, the antibody is binding, so it's detecting ERK phosphorylation. You see two nice bands there, one, one more intense than the other. But if you look in lanes 2 and 3, there is no band, no signal. And what that tells us is that ERK is no longer phosphorylated after treating the cells with this drug. So ERK phosphorylation decreases. And this is significant. So the ERK protein, if you look in the middle panel, ERK protein levels do not change, but ERK phosphorylation decreases when cells are treated with this drug. And like I said, we will learn that phosphorylation controls the activity of proteins. So scientists typically use Western blots um, using antibodies that detect phosphorylated versions of protein because, as we said, phosphorylation can control lots of different things about proteins, a number of different properties. Um, if you look in this middle panel here, another example, there's a protein called 4-EBP1. And so if they're interested in this protein, they're going to use antibodies to study it. Now, the, uh, the top two panels are also looking at levels of 4-EBP1, but they're looking at phosphorylated levels. So that top panel that says p 4 e 4-EBP1 THR70 must mean that they are using an antibody to detect the phosphorylated version of E4-EBP1 where the phosphorylation occurs at 3 70 um, The middle, the second panel down, 
This uses an antibody that binds the phosphorylated serine at position 5. The third panel down is just the total protein. So again, when researchers want to study a protein, they might be interested in knowing if total levels of the protein increase, decrease, or stay the same, or the phosphorylation of that protein increases, decreases, or stays the same. And in many times in the cell, protein, total protein levels don't increase or decrease, but the phosphorylation of those proteins changes. And we know phosphorylation can control a variety of aspects of protein function, activity, stability, localization, protein-protein interaction. So proteins uh, are really controlled by phosphorylation. So it's not surprising to see drugs that affect pathways that um, lead to changes in protein phosphorylation. So it's something that we're going to be seeing over and over. So hopefully now you can read a Western blot. You can uh, decipher uh, data um, shown in a Western blot. And not only looking at changes of total protein level, but changes of phosphorylated protein levels.